When people achieve the things they want to achieve, even when they seem wild and crazy or unrealistic, it's because they stay open, they don't know how it's going to happen, and if it hasn't happened yet, maybe the timing isn't right quite yet, but that you don't sit on your hands. Because if you sit on your hands, if I sit behind a closed door and wait for somebody to come and discover my artwork, it's very unlikely that it's going to happen. Now I'm crying. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Jane Dunnerwald. If you haven't yet listened to episode five, it really is worth going back and listening to it now before you listen to this one. Our conversation today is a beautiful meandering, including everything from why we might want to dismantle our inner committee of critics, to the importance of believing anything is possible, and why finding our personal team of cheerleaders is critical for creative growth. She also gives us some very practical things we can do to cultivate creativity for ourselves. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Here's part two of my conversation with Jane. I wanted to sort of go back to a little bit of the stuff in the book, the creative strength training, because I'm imagining that there are a lot of people out here who've been listening going, okay, yes, I'm going to go and I'm going to get myself this book and I'm going to, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to really, I see how important this is and I, and I want to do it. And so I just want to talk about some of the things that I really enjoyed from the book. Um, One of them was around dismantling the committee. And when when you were writing about that, I was like, yeah, I've always called them my board of directors. (laughs) Um, And you had a little bit of a different take on sort of how to deal with them. And and maybe for our listeners, can you give us a little bit of a rundown on what the committee is and why it exists and why people might wanna do the work of dismantling it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So for me, the committee is, the people who are critical of us. That's one aspect. And you usually know who someone like that is if you've never thought about it before, because as was true with me, I recognized when I was working on something in the studio that if it wasn't going well, I would start to hear voices. I would hear other people my dad was one, criticizing me. That's not looking good. That's never gonna go anywhere. Who do you think you are? He didn't say those specific things, but those are the kinds of things that committee members say. Uh What are you gonna do with that? Are you gonna be able to sell that? All of that from a creative standpoint, and if you're not involved in a creative endeavor right now, you've still got a committee. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And the committee's critical of how you keep your house or how you cook your food or the car that you, I mean, that can be about anything. But that's not the only committee member that, that's, that might be on your committee. The other people on the committee are people that we put there because we admire them so much, we want their approval. Mm. And so a couple of people who were on my committee are famous artists that I know and have have had some, not a lot of interaction, but some interaction with them. And I so admire them that I would start thinking what what one of those people would think about. Uh, uh So I think it's important to make that distinction because sometimes the people on your committee don't even know they're there. Uh Like I know I'm on a lot of people's committees. And not for good reasons. And I'm trying to dispel that all the time because that's the last thing I want. But that's, so you've got the two sides of that. You've got then the people who are there because they were dismissive. And you've got the people who were there because you want to please them so much. Approval, validation. And so the way that I recommend coming to terms with that, frankly, is to recognize who they are, first of all. And some people say, well, I'm my own worst critic and I can only say that you may believe that to be true, but no one came into this lifetime being self-critical. It's a learned behavior. And since it's a learned behavior, you had to learn it from something or someone. 
And so if you think, well, I'm just self-critical all the time and I don't know why, you can figure out why. And this is one of what I think of as the strategies of creative strength training, because you're right, what you said earlier, it's okay to acknowledge that something's true, but if you don't have a strategy to deal with it, you're not very likely to move forward. Right. And so what I recommend, and I think there's actually a free lecture on YouTube of my lecture on the committee. And what I recommend in that lecture and what I recommend in general, and what I said in the book is that once we recognize who the committee members are, then sometimes we can also figure out why, why they're there. So we can sort out, oh yeah, that person, my uncle Eddie was like really mean to me and said mean things when I was growing up. But this person over here, they're, they've never been mean to me. They're there because I, I, want, I want them to like me and by extension, I want them to like my work. And when I can figure out why they're there, that's the first step in dismantling the committee by getting clarity around why you see them in the way that you see them so that you can, if not dismiss them entirely, at least from a studio standpoint, if you start embroidering or hand stitching or you're throwing a pot or whatever it is that you're doing, you're cooking a dinner, whatever it is that's creative, whatever you're doing, you can sit them off to the side and literally rebuke the advice that you're getting from them and the criticism that you're getting from them. And it's not everybody's comfortable with this as kind of a role-playing thing, but I find a great deal of power in words. So there have been times when I was in the studio and this started to happen. And I literally said out loud to no one except the committee members who were along the wall, I rebuke you <laughs> Sit there and watch, but you're not allowed to talk to me right now. Right. And that plants a powerful seed. Mm -hmm. And so gradually you can let that committee just sort of dissolve itself out of your life. I don't have one anymore, but you can also replace the committee with what we eventually came to think of as the cheering section or the cheerleaders. And those are the people who do believe in you and who are kind with their comments and compassionate and always want you to achieve the best for yourself and the last part of the equation, which I think is so important, is that it's, I think there's a bit of self-reference here. We need to think about what, what kind of a committee member we might be to someone else mm -hmm. and whether we have been critical of other people in ways that were painful for them when we could have chosen to say something kind or encouraging instead. Well, and I think so many of the times that we experience these traumas, um, you, you, I mean, you talk in the book about uh, a memory you have of being in the backseat of your car and your dad sort of scolding you for, uh, you know, just doodling. You were, I think you were nine years old and you were just doodling your name in a notepad. And he said, he said, what he, fools names, like fools faces always show in public places. Mm -hmm. And my heart broke for you and for all the millions of other little girls out there who's who are subjected to these, these are just flippant comments and passing yeah. moments. And it, they're, I mean, that wasn't your father's best moment. And he had no idea how, you know, you talk about later on how that went to, that fed so much of your inability to talk about your work. And, and you had to go back and undo so much of that stuff to get him mm -hmm. off of your committee. Mm -hmm. But I did wonder um, when I was thinking about, cause I've done a little bit of stuff with shadow work and reclaiming sort of lost parts and do you think that any of the committee, any of what they're saying have nuggets of, of, can we mine what their, what their messages for anything useful? Or is it all just like, you have to shut up okay, or is there anything that we can say, okay, well, what is your, what is it? What's that the nut of what you're trying to give me? And can I, is there anything useful in it? Well, I think sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just baloney. Right. <laughs> and sometimes somebody's trying to say something to you that they mean in a constructive way, but because you take it so personally, you don't take it as constructive criticism. You take it as, uh, you, you take a hit. Right. And I think that as we gain strength through practicing how we think about this and by practicing loving kindness toward ourselves and our work, 
it becomes gradually, gradually is the operative word here. This isn't the sort of thing that's usually an overnight sensation. Mm -hmm. Gradually, we can grow into a new place where we view what people say to us less personally. So we're not taking it as personally. Mm -hmm. And then it's easier to think, well, now, what is it in what she said that might be helpful here? And maybe I'm just a little too, let's face it, you know, I, the sooner we can get real with ourselves about who we are, and that means that our shadows as well as our light. I know when I can be thin skinned and I know when I'm thin skinned, there are people who can zero in on that, uh -huh. their intuition, they know it and, and I'm going to take a hit. But instead of turning that back around and blaming them, I think the path to even greater personal clarity is to say, okay, I can see why that really hurt me. And maybe the way she phrased that was unkind, but maybe there's a kernel of knowledge here that's going to help me get a little bit stronger. And I could see how through building that, through, through working with the four pillars, like your talk or the four cornerstones that you could, you, with that confidence, you're able to weather, you know, those thin skin moments a little bit better and, and actually receive the what's being offered to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, for me, the mantra, and I actually, well, I don't have it on the wall in this studio. I'll have to f figure out where I put my little sign, but it, it's a quote from uh, Suzuki Roshi and it's, you're perfect the way you are. And it's in the book. So you've seen it. I have a little improvement. I love that. And when you settle into the joyful recognition that that's true of everybody, then when you get these thin skin moments or somebody says something that, that was hurtful, whether it was intentional or not, if it was intentional, then your reaction is, oh man, I feel so sorry for you that you would still not get the message that this isn't cool. Yeah. And then the flip side of that is, well, maybe I needed to hear that and I'm going to step back and take a breath and see it for what it was because I might be thanking them. That's what a noble friend does. Mm -hmm. A noble friend is the one that's always got something to say that you have to, ch that chafes, won't give you your way no matter what, mm -hmm. but it makes you stronger in the same way that certain kinds of, I don't know, I don't have a great nature thing, but uh, like a pearl, you know, the, yeah. it's the, whatever that agitation is that creates the pearl from a little grain of sand. And that's, that's what noble friends can do for us. And that's what those when we can get clarity about what other people are saying, I think that's what can happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wanted to go back a minute uh, and talk about alignment because we were, we were talking about that a, a few minutes ago, and I think it is a really important thing to, to, to discuss. And I know that I think a lot of us, when we're young, we think, oh, we're going to grow up and one day everything's going to be clear. I'm going to know what I want. I'm going to know how I'm going to, how to do it and how to bring it all about what my purpose is. And, and it actually, it, it really isn't that easy. And uh, I think I've noticed a tendency, uh, and I, I don't want to make this a male-female thing, but it, I, ha I have noticed it, especially among women, that we have this tendency to align to other people's desires mm -hmm. and other people's needs and other people's expectations of us. And so there is this sort of training or conditioning that happens around, you know, how we use our life energy. And so um, how does creative strength training help you to support somebody to to not only come into alignment, but discover even like, how do you even begin the process of finding out? Well, what I know that what I've been doing in my life hasn't been bringing me a whole bunch of delight. So something's off, but I don't even know what I do want. I don't even know what I, what art I want to try or what, I don't even know what I want. How, so how can creative strength training help somebody to connect with and discover that and then stand behind it and align with it? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm big on, once again, it's a strategy. I'm big on writing. And I'm not talking about angst-filled journal writing or daily pages or anything like that. I'm, I'm talking about practical writing as an assist to making. And in this particular instance, what I usually recommend, actually it's outlined in, in the book, 
in order to figure out alignment, which is essentially back to preferences, uh -huh. it works to make three lists. And the first list is all the things that you know how to do or that you're good at doing. And the second list is all the things that you really love to do. And the third list is things that you wish you knew how to do or that you would like to improve on. And when you get your lists made, then you can look at the first two lists. So I'm looking at the list of the things I know how to do. And then I'm looking at the list of things I love to do. And when something is a match, then I'm in alignment there. Okay. And if I'm really good at something, but I don't like to do it, which is frequently how people talk about their professions. Uh -huh. Somebody can be a really great accountant, but they're an accountant because their parents wanted them to be an accountant in the same way that my parents wanted me to be a minister. And they hate being an accountant. So then they're out of alignment. And from a creative standpoint, it can be somebody who's really good at a particular technique. And this happens all the time. Well, I don't know, maybe not all the time, but it happens that they're really good at a, they get locked into a particular creative method or, or even a uh, subject matter. And the gallery loves what they're doing. And then they want to change what they're doing, but the gallery doesn't want uh -huh. them to change. So there are a lot of ways that people can be out of alignment when they are really good at something, but it's lost its juice for them. And I think the only way to really put your finger on that is literally to make these lists so that you can see clearly. And then you go over to your wannabe list and you go through that a little bit at a time. And what, what would I really like to be doing with that negotiable time that I have? Uh -huh. And like for the longest time, learning to play the steel guitar was on my list of things I want, thought I wanted to learn to do. I didn't want to learn to play the steel guitar. <laughs> how, did you, I did. how did you get that off the list? How did that finally come about? I finally thought, okay, which is how you handle the things on that list. You think, okay, let's strategize this. If I want to learn to play the steel guitar, I'm not going to do it thinking about it. Right. So I'll have to have access to a steel guitar somewhere and I'll have to have access to a teacher that's gonna involve some money. Then I'll have to have time to practice if I really wanna get good at playing the steel guitar because it's not gonna come by osmosis. And then I looked at, I thought, okay, they're expensive. I don't have one. I don't even know where I would buy one. I don't know anybody who teaches it. And this sounded like fun, but there's no way I'm going to do that. And the beauty of having that recognition, whatever it is, is that it's off the list. So it mm -hmm. opens up mental space for something else. Right. And yeah. it can go the other way. I had a student that I, I, I counseled in an independent study. And she was this example of somebody who was really good at the quilting that she did. And she said, I just, I dread going in the studio. I don't want to do it. And I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? I want to go to school and learn to be a pastry chef. I said, well, do you really want to do that? What would be involved in that? So she listed just like I listed for you. And I said, well, so the next step is to go home, sleep on it 24 hours, see how you feel about it tomorrow. And if you're charged up enough to start doing the research to make that happen for yourself, then that's probably going to feel like a third chakra intuitive hit. And let me know how it goes. A year later, she wrote to me, she had a business as a pastry chef. I love that. She never turned her, she turned her back on quilting and she never looked back. And wow. she said to me, when I said to her, why do you keep doing it if there's no more joy in it for you? And she said, because everybody at church thinks I'm so good. Uh -huh. Committee. Uh -huh. committee. Totally committee. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's also a piece around um, you know, I've invested, I'm pot committed. I've invested so much in my tools and my equipment. People know me for this. How can I start over again? I mean, that, I mean, it is all committee saying all that stuff, but, yeah. but part of that does, um, you know, feel it, it, those are scary, you know, new frontier kind of things to, to mm -hmm. face. And I, um, I wonder what you say to people who have, cause I, so desire as you're, as you're saying that it, it, it's making me realize like how important it is to connect with like desire as a, 
as like the main power of your GPS. What is it I want and how much do I want it? And that's going to dictate how much you're willing to put into it. And then all that, all that can happen. But what happens for when somebody has a desire that just really, uh, versus reality. So desire versus being a realist or being led by desire versus being led by being a realist. And I asked because I had one of those dreams of recently where, you know, you've probably only had like three or four of them in your life where you're just like, this was a dream that felt really, and it was a, a very well-known person who I really, really admire because of some of the amazing work that she's doing in the world. And she was sitting next to me on this couch and she was kind of up on her knees and she was really excited. And she was like, she wanted to share this, this information she had with me. And she said, do you think that I got where I am today by being a realist? No, I knew what I had to do. And I, and I knew what I wanted and I knew it didn't make sense, but I just kept creating it. And I just kept going and you know what you're here to do. And if you're going to make this happen, you have to stop being a realist. You have to become a desireist. Mm -hmm. And I, and it was, it's been with me. It's, that was weeks ago. And it's just been, cause I, I do find that I, I've spent most of my life being a, a realist and well, I could try that, but, and so, I mean, I guess based on some of the things you were saying, I have more work to do with my committee. But sometimes I feel like the things that I want are, are, are actually crazy. And how do you, how do you tell somebody how to figure out, like, is what you're, are you being delusional or is this really a possibility that you could learn how to master this or be this, or how do you reconcile those two things and, and live in a place where you don't feel like you're, I mean, I imagine the pastry chef had moments where she was like, why am I doing this? This feels sure. crazy. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure. Um, well. This episode of Creative Genius is brought to you by Morning Moon Nature Jewelry. Instantly familiar, yet unlike anything you've ever owned, this extraordinary handcrafted heirloom jewelry is famous for its incredible detail of actual textures from nature. Get 15% off your first order and feel the wonder. Use coupon code CREATIVEGENIUS at lovemorningmoon.com. One of my strongest beliefs, because I am an instructor and that gives me a lot of power, so I think that a lot of instructors don't take that as seriously as they should, frankly, because you can literally make or break somebody's dreams. Uh -huh. And so I never, ever say to someone, you're not capable of that. Never. And I never even... I may have moments where I think I'm not really sure you're up to achieving this, but that's not for me to say out loud. Uh -huh. The role that we should play for each other, in my opinion, is to believe that if someone is meant to accomplish something, no matter how unlikely it might seem to one of to you or me, they could. Hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. Uh -huh. And so the best help I can offer when I feel as though somebody has a big, big dream and it doesn't seem realistic, isn't to say, maybe better tamp that down a little bit and get more realistic about your plan. It's to say, most of the time, when people achieve the things they want to achieve, even when they seem wild and crazy or unrealistic, it's because they stay open. They don't know how it's going to happen. And if it hasn't happened yet, maybe the timing isn't right quite yet, but that you don't sit on your hands. Because if you sit on your hands, if I sit behind a closed door and wait for somebody to come and discover my artwork, very unlikely that it's going to happen. Now I'm crying. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. So I have to keep believing that I will. And, and I think it's the power of attraction too. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say in the morning, I have to write, or I have to think to myself about, about my dream and what I want to have happen. And then I have to look for opportunities to use my strategies to propel forward. That voice that you were just 
talking about animating and the message around, you know, when you're a teacher and you can't, you tell people like all those things that you just said, how, how do we become that voice for ourselves? Because not all of us are lucky enough to have a teacher like you or a voice like you in our lives every day who can, who can say all the things that you just said, mm -hmm. you know, and that you, you did reach my heart and I, I thank you. Um, but for those of us who don't, who are listening to this going, okay, I, I, I want to be that voice for myself. How can we start to do that? Well, I, I, I think it's helpful not to isolate, not to expect to be able to figure it all out alone, goes back to the community. I think that it can start by thinking about one person that we trust that we could talk to about our dream who won't shut it down. Mm -hmm. I can think, I, I think that it's also related to looking for, frankly, groups like CST. I, I'm sure there are others out there that just happens to be the one that's near and dear to my heart, but that's what we do. We nurture people's crazy dreams. That's kind of the business that we're in. <laughs> and then I really, I don't know. I don't want anyone to, well, I'm just gonna throw it out there. If it's meant to happen, it, it happens. I can't tell you how many emails I personally have gotten from people, not necessarily in CST. I don't just answer emails from people in CST. I get emails from people that I've never met and they've never been in a class with me. And it's very unlikely they ever will be in a class with me. And yet something about some message that they heard, like maybe even in the future, this conversation you and I are having, they felt touched by it and they feel compelled to reach out to me and share a little bit about their own experience or their own fears. And so what I'm really recommending is don't write to me. I mean, you anybody could and I would answer. <laughs> but the point is, if there is someone that you really admire related to whatever that crazy dream is, even if it's somebody who doesn't look as though it could in any way, shape, or form help you achieve what you want to achieve, I think just writing and sharing what your dream is or what your fears are with someone and saying, I really admire you. And I wrote to you because I really admire you. And I just wanted to share what's happening with me and tell you how much, you know, it meant to me to read this book that you wrote or see you in, you know, that Ted talk that you did, or I think it's important to write those things. It's also important not to automatically expect, expect someone to write back because some people wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I've written to Caroline Mays four times. She has a huge queen archetype. She's never written back to me. <laughs> I'm not going to take it personally. I yeah. still, I still think she's amazing and I've learned so much from her. I can't be critical of that. In fact, I probably understood it when I put the envelope in the mail. Yeah. But I still think that that's part of believing yourself into where you're headed is to have that courage to write to someone because you might be surprised what you would get back in exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's really helpful for me. And I hope that for the person listening who also has a big audacious dream that that can be helpful mm -hmm. for them too. Cause I, 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 so much of what you're saying, I got goosebumps when you say it, like it's, there's a deep resonance with what you're saying. Yeah. It feels and really true. One other thing occurred to me here, Kate, is that I've just said, reach out and share, but I, I want to counter that by saying, don't tell everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I, you said that. Because, you know, here's how we kill ideas. We get a great idea. Six chakra comes in. We got this fabulous intellectual idea and then it connects in order to ever manifest. It's got to connect with your heart. Mm -hmm. So it connects with your heart and you get really excited about it. Then unfortunately, what you can do is talk it to death and you can share it with people who are committee people and it can get shot out of the water. And so, 
you know, in the Bible, I think it says, and Mary pondered these things and held Mary, the, the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary pondered these things and held them in her heart. And you don't have to be a Christian for that good advice to, to resonate. I think yeah. we have to be mindful and have really healthy, do the best job we can to have healthy boundaries so we don't just start talking to everybody about what we want to do. We think selectively, who could I talk to about this? Who will be supportive? And then as the idea gets bigger and you begin to see it take more shape, maybe there'll be people to talk to that I'm watching my son-in-law right now have this big dream related to, to bicycles because he doesn't want to go back to the restaurant business. And I'm watching him look at all kinds of opportunities and think about who to reach out to, but he's not talking it to death. He's holding a lot of that really close to his chest and thinking about who are the best people to talk to before, before it starts being really a public idea that he has. Yeah. And I think that that's, so it's something that I've done a lot of in my life. I also have, I guess my crown chakra must be wide open because I get so many big ideas that often feel like really important and really have a lot of life in them. And what I've done to a lot of them over my life is I've done that right away. I've just kind of started to talk about them to the wrong people or whatever. And um, it was only recently that I, I think I saw it was, a, it was a passing comment. I saw somebody on another post about something totally unrelated, but somebody said, oh yeah, oversharing is a trauma response. And I, it stopped me in my tracks because I've, I've been an oversharer all my life. And I realized, I mean, it's my nature to be open and to share and to, you know, cry and be leaky and all that stuff. But, but the oversharing tendency is something that I needed to heal so that I could, when I had these baby ideas, nurture them and make sure, you know, it's like when you have a newborn, you, you, you don't let everybody at the party hold the baby. You, you, there's only a couple of people that get to hold the baby. And, and so, you know, for anybody who's listening, who, who notices that they often overshare, mm -hmm. I just wanted to offer that too, that, that, that was life-changing for me when I realized that actually I had to guard this, this one big thing that I have right now that I'm my big audacious dream. I'm, I'm not sharing it with everybody yet because it's, I've gotten that sort of maturity around, you know, mm -hmm. and it feels really different. It actually feels really different to the idea. Didn't go away. Now it's, there's this, it's deepening and it's living in me and it's, it's, it's taking on a sort of a different nature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's a brilliant point. And I love the analogy of the baby because in my early years, I was an oversharer too. And I think that for me, at least, the analysis of that in the long run was that I was so insecure about everything that I needed other people's opinions about everything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I needed healthy boundaries in order to begin to rebuild my self-esteem. Uh -huh. And I, yeah. I gradually did it. And now I feel really, really in charge and strong about that. So... But, but you can you can sense who those people are as soon as they walk into the room you can in, in workshops because they won't shut up mm -hmm. <laughs> and i always feel so um excited when someone like that comes into one of my real-time workshops because i know by the end of the week i will have been able to quiet them how do you do that and you do that in a in an art making setting by being lavish with compliments that are real oh. so that they begin to trust you you know there's something in transactional analysis called the stroke economy and the stroke economy has to do with economizing strokes and strokes are things that we do to um, make other people feel good and there are five rules for the stroke economy, and I don't have them memorized, but for example, one of them is that you can't give somebody too many strokes. So don't pick up the crying baby because you'll spoil the crying right. baby. Which has been disproven. Exactly. Scientifically. Then the, the baby is stroke deprived. And you can't, uh, you can't accept strokes from other people. So if someone says, oh, what a beautiful dress you're wearing, or I love the background you have on your screen. Oh, this old dress. So you discount it. And that takes a, your self-esteem takes a hit then. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of the stroke economy is you can't ask for strokes. 
So people live their entire lives being afraid to talk about what they need and want in order to find joy. And I thought, yeah, yeah. and those needs and wants don't go anywhere. They're still, the the needs are still there. They're just not being met. Yeah. And so back to my workshop setting, I didn't really know about the stroke economy until recently when a psychologist wrote to me and shared it with me because she's in CST and she thought it was an appropriate thing to think about in regard to a a group conversation we'd had. But it immediately resonated with me from a creative standpoint because that's exactly what I was doing without knowing it in my workshops is giving out as many strokes as anybody wanted or needed so that they would begin to have a sense of their own ability and build their confidence in those five days that I had them because they could literally leave on Friday, having had some small bit of their life changed just by being in that environment with other people who were being uh, mentored in the same way. So that then the energy rose within the group. And one of the highest compliments I was ever paid in a workshop setting is that on the evaluation that the, the host organization collected, one woman wrote, what I loved most about the workshop was the encouragement to share and the encouragement to believe that there was enough for everybody because you don't always get that in a workshop setting. You don't. And I wanted, I wanted to, this is the perfect moment to share this with you before every episode. I I have this beautiful carved heart wooden bowl and I have little angel cards in it. And I, I pull one word that sort of and the word for our episode together today was kindness, which oh. I just, it's so perfect. Cause that's just, it's like so much who you are and what your work is about. And, and I've been to a million workshops with various incredible instructors from around the world on a million different things. And there, there are often always one there's, oh, I would, I would say almost always, there's almost always one participant who comes in with that energy. And I don't know that I've ever witnessed an instructor approach it with the kindness that you're describing. And I just think it is a magic wand, like kindness. It, it's so simple and it's so, but it isn't easy for everybody. And, and I think that that's such a, such an important thing that needs to be underlined, like kindness, you know, we can say it and it sounds a little bit trite, oh, but it's deeply, deeply powerful to see another human being and to just take a moment to choose to extend them that kindness can, can be so transformational. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, Caroline Mace calls that invisible acts of power. Mm. Mm. Obviously, I need to read a little bit more Caroline Mace. I, I, a little bit I have of her, yeah. but that's a good book to start with because it's very accessible. Yeah, that's the name of the book. I think it is the name of the okay. book. Okay, there, there, my local bookstore I think has a whole Caroline Mace shelf. <laughs> she has her own. Um, I I feel like I need to have you back on the show again because there are still so many other things I want to talk to you about. But I feel like I want to just I want to just respect your time and and everybody listening to this. You know this. We'll save some for next time if, okay. if that's okay. Well, you name the time and place because I would talk to you anytime you wanted to talk. It's been such a privilege. Wonderful. Uh, really delightful. Really. I'm gonna. Thank you. I'm I'm absolutely gonna take you up on that. And good luck um, with this endeavor of yours. Thank you. I have one more question for you. Sure. Uh, it's the billboard question. Oh. So I ask this at the end of every episode. If you had a billboard that every person in the world who longed to be an artist, but for whatever reason, for all the reasons we've talked about and reasons beyond that, just didn't believe that they had it in them or couldn't do it, what would you put on it? Well, I thought about this when you wrote to me, and this is what I came up with last night, which I actually put into a visual form. And I don't know whether you saw that email or not, but I did um, accept and love yourself. It's the start of everything good. But then today I thought I, maybe it would just say, go make something right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think they belong really well together. They I, I start here, accept and love yourself and then go get to work. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. Oh, um, okay. So for, for everybody listening, who's so excited to learn more about you and your work, where do you want them to go? What's the best place for them to go and find out about your work? And you, uh, oh, yeah, you have a, you have a, you've, you've got a new book coming up too. So maybe you want to say a little bit about that too. Well, it's a book on botanical printing using the heat press, which is right over there. 
and it's kind of revolutionary and and that's good it's not really related to what we're talking about but that's what i'm working on myself right now but for in order to find out about anything i'm doing the best thing to do is to go to janedunnawald.com okay and so, uh, especially uh if if anyone is interested in knowing about ongoing projects because you can sign up for my newsletter there i it's, I think it's unethical to sign people up for newsletters. Mm -hmm. So they have to sign up on their own, but we put one out. Uh, we try not to overload people. We put one out about every six weeks and it always has an essay and usually it has a recipe. And I like to highlight what other people are doing. So I usually share links for other people's work too. And I try to make it entertaining and not a waste of time because I think Anytime I communicate with someone, I want them to look forward to getting something in the inbox. I don't yeah. want them to hit the lead automatically. So yeah. I'll put a link to that in the, in the show notes for everybody. That'd be great. Okay. That'd be great. And is there anything else that you want to say before we, before we wrap up for today? We've covered no, so much. I love your backdrop. I love oh, your backdrop. Thank you. This is, um, this is a huge painting I'm working on. It, if I don't, it's like a, I think it's five feet by four feet by five feet. It's really big. But if I don't have this here, you're looking at my refrigerator. Okay. So this is a much nicer view. <laughs> I look at that anytime. It's beautiful. Thank you. So glad to get to know you and meet you. Thank you. Thank you again. No, thank you too. I'm, I feel the same way. Thank you. Talk okay. to you soon. All right. Take Bye. care. You too. Bye. Bye. I feel like it would be a really good idea to listen to both of these episodes with Jane Donawald a few times. I know I will be. There were so many important things she shared with us. Everything from the importance of dismantling our inner committee of judges to why we should be dropping everything to learn how to interpret and begin to trust messages from our gut. I was especially moved by her urging to find and become our own cheerleaders to support bringing our dreams to life. I loved her reminder that no matter how crazy they may seem, if we stay open look for opportunities to make our dreams happen. Truly anything, everything becomes possible. You heard me tell Jane during the interview that the card I pulled before the show was kindness. So I'll leave you with this thought. What would be available to you if you approached yourself and your journey to creativity with radical kindness? I have a fun challenge for you. Forward this episode to the first friends that pop to mind right now don't overthink it. There's a reason you thought of them. You never know, you might change their lives forever. See a picture of my favorite piece of Jane's work and find links to her website, including how to join the creative strength training community in the show notes on kateshepherdcreative.com slash creative genius. That's S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support the show, please consider joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash creative genius podcast. Your support helps make it possible for me to continue bringing you these inspiring conversations with artists every other week. As a Patreon member, you'll have access to things like bonus content, live ask me anything sessions, and even original art sent right to your door. We have an incredible lineup of guests coming up. You won't want to miss a single one. So before you forget, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And I would love it if you'd head over to iTunes to leave the show a review. I love your feedback. It helps me learn how to continue to evolve and improve the show for you. And did you know you can watch full video of most of our episodes? Head over to katesheppardcreative.com slash creative genius for all the details. Thank you again for listening. May you find and unleash your creative genius.